Hello, this is the final video of our little lecture on quantitative uh, PCR. I'd like to call it the fourth chapter and that is the melting curve. So why do you need a melting curve? Well, it's a way to assure that uh, the quality of your PCR amplification has been all right. So in particular, what you're afraid of when doing quantitative PCR is that you aren't really amplifying your template but that you are rather amplifying something that we call primer dimers. So what's primer dimers? Well it's easy enough. What you're hoping to amplify using your primers is of course a piece of DNA that corresponds to your template. Something like that. That's what you're hoping. But if you didn't design your primers well or if your PCR conditions weren't right, what you get instead is something like that. The two primers, or actually it can be one primer of the same species as well, would bind to each other and hybridize to each other at their three prime ends. Maybe two or three nucleotides of hybridization are enough. And then they will be filled in like that. And this will result in primer dimers. Once you have that in the reaction, once you have templates like this available, they will just bind the primers like nothing and they will be continuous to, to amplify like that. And they will just outcompete your real template because your real template takes much longer to be amplified. So primer dimers are a very dangerous competitor to your reaction. So this is something that you want to control for. You want to avoid the primer dimers. So if you got them anyway, at least you want to know that you have actually not amplified your favorite DNA, but rather you have amplified the primer dimers. And that's what the melting curve is for. Why can you just analyze that by a melting curve? Well, I guess you can appreciate that these will fall apart at lower temperatures then the real PCR product. Typically the real PCR product will fall apart at say 85 degrees or a higher temperature whereas the primer dimers will already fall apart between 80 and 85 degrees uh, Celsius. So if you carefully discriminate at what temperature your DNA becomes single-stranded you can discriminate the primer dimers that you didn't want and distinguish them from the real PCR product that is typically at least a hundred or more nucleotides in length. How can you do that by the melting curve? Well, it's quite easy. What the machine or what the uh, PCR machine will do for you in the end of a PCR run is to, pro is to heat up or to cool down your sample over a wide range of temperatures. So here's the temperature, but it's large T. It isn't small T for time, it's large T for temperature and it will again tell you the intensity of fluorescence that the cyber green will provide you with. Remember, the cyber green will only give you fluorescence if your DNA is double-stranded. So guess what happens at a real low temperature? You think you will have a strong intensity of fluorescence or a low intensity of fluorescence at a low temperature? Huh? Well, of course, the DNA will be double-stranded at a low temperature and that's why you will have a high intensity of fluorescence. Now, what will happen at a real high temperature, say at uh, 90 degrees or more? Will you get a high intensity of fluorescence or a low intensity? Well, of course you will get a low intensity because now everybody is single-stranded, right? So, if you now increase the temperature from a low temperature, you go higher and higher. Then at some point, the DNA will start falling apart. And that's why you get less intensity with your cyber green stain and it will become less and less and less and less until it goes to zero. So that's basically the melting curve that you will get. 
but this is nothing that is very convenient to handle. What you want is a melting point, right? If you had a melting point, it would be much easier to tell where exactly your DNA, at what temperature the, the DNA has been falling apart. You can then use one number to calculate that. So how do you do that? Well, typically you try to find out at what temperature the intensity curve was turning. So this is a bit difficult to understand like that, but let's assume you are riding a bicycle. So here is a bicycle. And you are riding this bicycle along your curve. So what will you need to do in order to go along this curve here? Well, you will need to tilt in that direction. And if you then go further with your bicycle, you will need to tilt to the other direction in order not to fall because now the curve goes to your left hand side. So this is how you ride your bicycle. But at one point in between, and that's exactly this point here, the turning point, there you will be in an upright position. And that's what you typically define as your melting point. So how can you mathematically describe this melting point? Well, I'm sure you have heard about this in your mathematics classes again. How can you determine this turning point? Well, what you do first is to calculate the first derivative. You want to know how much the intensity changes at a given interval. So over here, we have no change in intensity. It is and remains high and that's why your first derivative that the physicists typically write like this first derivative of the intensity in relation to the temperature. This first derivative will remain zero when you don't change the intensity with the temperature. However, at this point here you start changing the intensity to the negative. And it's getting more and more negative until you reach the turning point. And then this first derivative will move up again and then remain zero at the point where you no longer change it. So the minimum of this first derivative corresponds to the turning point of the real melting curve. So plotting it that way is a bit inconvenient if you want to do this on a computer screen. And that's why most people prefer to put the negative of this first derivative. So they would draw it like this. But it's just mirrored at the x-axis. And it's now the maximum of this first derivative, or its negative, that corresponds to the turning point of the melting curve. So that's all. All you need to do is to calculate the maximum of this negative first derivative and that's the melting temperature. That's it. Easy enough. How does it look like in the real world? That's shown here. What you see here is that your PCR product has been heated up and at this point here, this negative of the first derivative, right, it's D of the intensity or relative fluorescence unit over temperature reaches its, ma its maximum. So all you need to do is to watch this maximum and that's here at 85 degrees and that's okay. It means that your PCR has been okay and that your PCR product consists mainly of the full length PCR product because otherwise your curve would have another maximum about here and that would be reflecting the primer dimers. As a take home message, the melting point
is the temperature, that corresponds to the turning point in your melting curve, that is the intensity plotted against or as a function of the temperature. And that's the minimum of the first derivative intensity versus temperature. And that corresponds to the maximum of its negative minus first derivative of intensity as a function of the temperature. And this number should be around 85 degrees Celsius but not 80 or less. If you understand that you know how to interpret the melting curve that you obtain at the end of your quantitative PCR.